So uh, we'll, we will start presenting cases for them to just give their opinions. Everyone can uh, ask whatever they want, hit their opinions in regards to radiological and clinical issues. So everyone feel free just to raise their hand, ask questions, and then we can go like this. And then Dr. Doe Kenny will be presenting a lecture on posterior retrovalve. valve. But we decided to let it for later when there are more people uh, there, okay? So, do you, do you have the, the presentation? You have the slides? Yes. yes. Okay. So, Doug, this is a 10-month male patient mm -hmm. which was referred as multicystic kidney disease. But the pediatrician noticed there is a fastly growing flank mass. Mm -hmm. And then they refer it for clinical evaluation. Mm -hmm. And at that time, his 10 months male, there was a big volume tumor at the kidney space, which was almost mm -hmm. getting into the midline. So then I, I will let uh, Dr. Darge to yeah. okay. comment. Yeah. We have a setting of exams. You just see what you see. Yeah. Your, your C, and then we will okay. start discussing like that. So, is this the right or left kidney, or both kidneys? I think it's the right kidney. So the, it's the right kidney. The left kidney was normal. The left kidney was Well, normal. let me check, because I don't remember. Oh, uh, this but is, <coughs> your, your, this one is better. Yes. This, this left. Okay, you just go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, we're having a, okay, I'm told it's one kidney. It, it appears relatively big. There are multiple cis different sizes. The renal parenchyma is abnormal, being echogenic. Uh, there is no real corticomedullary differentiation. The only thing uh, I'm, I'm not clear is, are, are these echogenic round uh, as masses or just part of it? I cannot identify it very well. There are another pictures. Because that's very important. So, so this is the whole, the whole? The whole kidney, yes. That's the whole kidney. So then if this part is the upper pole and this part is the lower pole, so we have in the lower pole multiple cystic structures. Is the left or the right? Left? The think, right. I think said. it's right because okay. vena cava. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. So the right kidney. So the upper pole, you see a renal parenchyma, but the lower pole, you see uh, multiple cysts with thin walls, non-communicating. Uh, that's better. Okay. And, and maybe you see, I'm not sure this is a, a renal pelvis or just a compressed part of the kidney. Okay, go on. Okay, so this doesn't show the whole kidney. Maybe the, this is the upper pole still, but there are multiple cystic structures, thin walled, not much parenchyma, and that what is there is abnormal. It's right. It's, right. it's the right kidney. Right, yes, hinge to genito is right. Mm -hmm. So, so we have a, a, at times you have the upper pole being depicted, and then uh, on on these ones the lower pole multicystic. How old is the child? Uh, ten months. Ten months. Yes. Okay. Again, another. More yeah, of the same. same. And the, here is, uh, I think it's, uh, they put some uh, Doppler here mm -hmm. in the upper pole. Yeah. It's not colored, but I think it, they want, intended to show there was some parenchyma, uh, parenchyma mm -hmm. yes. functioning. Okay. okay. And then, uh, any comments uh, before we go on, uh, Doug? Uh, it's just, uh, so do we have any early uh, prenatal imaging on this? Well, actually, it was uh, told as normal. Uh, no, really? They, really. Pre yeah, pre and the, opposite, the other kidney is normal? It's absolutely normal. It's just okay. on the right side. Okay. Um, so the right side has a cystic mass in the lower pole uh, of the kidney. The upper pole looks, looks okay. We don't have nice images of the upper pole. Okay. Okay, we did a DMSA scan and show something more or less like this. Mm -hmm. Confirming good function <coughs> to the, the upper pole. pole. Yeah. And again here. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, any questions uh, from the from the from the other centers? Uh, Bida. No, just a, a comment. Uh, 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 looks like a, 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 a lower pole mode cyst displaces displaces kidney. So I'd like to see better the anatomy and and also uh, VCUG to see if there is any VCUG? kind of reference. Yes. Okay. Well, what, what, what would be good? It would be unusual uh, for this to be multi-cystic kidney if the prenatal imaging was definitely normal. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that makes me a little worried. And another, another important remark is that the pediatrician, uh, he did all his physical exams and he didn't notice anything abnormal yeah. in the early uh, consultations. And after that, he, he noticed there was something growing and growing fast. Yeah. And when we examined this patient, it was really tense. It was yeah. not uh, smooth. Like we yeah. normally, sometimes you feel the, the multicystic kidney when it's big, mm -hmm. but there is some smooth, and he was tense. Yeah. MCDK is also usually in the upper pole, not the lower pole, but it's possible. Um, but uh, the, the rest of the other kidney, I'm not sure it's really normal. That's a little bit worried, but we don't have nice images to, to say that. I mean, it's functioning, yeah. but whether it's appropriately functioning, it's hard just to say. Also, it's not quite the right split. You know, it's not quite the right separation uh, for a duplex system. Um, so, my differential at this point. I mean, there are mosaics. Mosaic. You know, so yeah. On the one hand, you have cystic disease of the kidney, which you would have expected to see in the in the antenatal imaging. Or you have acquired lesions, you know, which would be an atypical Wilms or a mesoblastic nephroma. Mm -hmm. These two things I'm yes. concerned about. Especially because of the rapidly growing yeah, pattern. that's right. Salvador, any comments? No, I think I, I, I agree with Dr. Kenny. Uh, but maybe there could be something else in it. Uh, at the end, this child has to go to the theater, and uh, the decision, I think, would be exactly what to do uh, at the operating room. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, in our case, we would have done an MRI. An MRI. Yes. That would definitely show us the, the distribution, and it gives, gives us a better differentiation. I mean, at least in our setting, we yes. have done an MRI. In terms of uh, next step, uh, would you... Well, you have an a, a VCUG here. Let, let's have a look. Is it... Uh, it's normal. Normal, it's no, okay. No, that's no, that's reflex. So I, so I think if this is getting bigger, um, you're going to need, you're going to need to operate. And, yes. uh, uh, you know, again, it'd be, no, be nice to get a real good look with an MR if you have it. If, yes. If you, if you don't, um, I, I agree. Um, if this thing is expanding, you're going to need it to uh, to examine it surgically. Yes. And uh, the question is, uh, do you do you go in and and uh, uh, and biopsy, and then treat? Uh, do you treat up front, presuming it's a Wilms, or do you um, go ahead and and try to do either a nephron sparing or a total nephrectomy yes. on that side? And so you have to go in with all of those uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I think in this, it's it's not a, you know. Although you can certainly get a Wilms tumor in this age group, to me it doesn't look quite like a Wilms tumor. Mm -hmm. um, I would favor something like a mesoblastic nephroma. Those are hard to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, they're much more difficult partial nephrectomy than uh, than a Wilms would be. Uh, if it was more of a typical Wilms, I think in today. Uh, if the boy had, was otherwise uh, normal, had a normal kidney on the other side, had no other signs of uh, a syndromic type of uh, problem, you know, we'd probably take him to the operating room with the idea of trying to do a nephron sparing. Although I will say that our we still in North America have not quite evolved to the point where we're doing partials on you know unilaterals if the tumor is big. 
Yeah. We like we like to do them. We like to do them best after treatment. It's much easier to take yes. out after right. treatment than before. So, yes. All right. So we, we'd go in like you say. I think it's time to have a look. Okay, uh, Miguel, uh, would you consider uh, biopsying or doing a pre-surgical chemotherapy for considering, like for instance, Williams tumor, and to get this mass? smaller to make it easier to do the operation? Or would you go for surgery and then make a, an exploration? Because it's very different case, not the age we are used to see tumors. So I'd like to see your opinion. Uh, it's very difficult, different case. I have no experience for this case, but uh, I prefer a uh, surgery. I don't make a biopsy for this case. Okay. Okay. Any 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 other comments? So we decide to go for uh, to surgery because mm -hmm. uh, the family was very yeah. anxious. Mm -hmm. We could have had a yeah. MR or but, yeah, I mean, if not a MR, at least CT. It yes, makes it easier. Yes, yes. Yeah. But the thing was that um, mm. we decided the, the pediatrician was a little bit uh, worried about as well. So uh, we went yeah. for surgery, and uh, to us, really, the aspect looks more like a well. Oh, looks like a well. Yeah. So we decide to do yeah. uh, radical, yeah. not a partial. Yeah. Well, I I do believe that uh, partial nephrectomy is for synchronous uh, tumors. I don't like the idea of doing. Yeah. Uh, you have a lot on the line. Unilateral. Yeah. Yes. And this is a pretty small cap of tissue at the top. Uh, you could have. If you know ahead, in a perfect world, if we knew ahead of time, I do believe that there will be a day when we're doing all of these with chemo up front and, and uh, partials, you know, mop up partials. But That's right. we're not there yet, I don't think. Any comments, Bira? No, it's a very interesting case. Uh, I think an MRI could uh, 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 give us a, a clue of. Uh, uh, before what's uh, what what's happened what was happening actually was this did this look uh in this in the in the spectrum of, of what we used to call a, a, a multilocular cystic nephroma type of thing or yes was we it, were expecting yeah. something like that yeah. but it was a classic uh, Wilms, uh, Wilms, Wilms, yeah. but very favorable yeah, histology very good, yeah. and uh, we refer for a pediatrician from this clinic you saw here uh, on right, the front yeah. And they decide for the age, for the aspects, not even to do chemotherapy. Wow. Just for, ah, yes, that because was doing stage one, very yes, good. stage one, favorable, mm -hmm. unusual, but yeah. sure, there will be yeah. uh, clinical surveillance. That's an unusual. This unusual. Unusual. cystic pattern is making cystic sense. pattern. Well, is actually, we have a case uh, yeah. published before of a segmental multicystic uh, yeah. disease. Mm which is also very rare. Yeah, I think yeah. there are 50 cases published. I remember when we published the case. We were in the beginning thinking it could be like that, but it, it was different. It was really high speed growing, so. Yeah. Uh, okay. How was it picked up? The, the, parent, the mother felt it? Sorry? The mother The pediatrician, the pediatrician. Following good. the patient every month. Very good. Yeah, it was great. So, this is also an, an, another case Yesterday, they show us very nice cases in the discussion from yesterday. We have uh, ectopia and things related to the urogenital sinus and uh, other things. So this is the case I wanted to show you. This is a four-month male uh -huh. patient who was micturating by the anus. And he was absolutely normal except that he had some uh, perianal hyperemia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tatiana? Oh, yes. Let's see if we can see it, this case. Uh, oh, this was seen by nice. the mother. Oh, oh uh, very oh, nice, oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> And out the tip too, right? Yes. You saw some urine come from the tip. Yes, that's right. That's right. Some some, huh. some drops of urine. So so th th this guy has a great video. It <laughs> was done by the mother. Yes, yeah. actually, you see, it's not no, no, clean. No, no. <laughs> no, I'm talking about uh, your video on the duplex urethra. Oh yes. Oh yes. Spectacular. Yes, that's good. Yeah. It's another case. Yeah. This is case. amazing. Yes. 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 
Okay. So let's move. Tatiana? I think it's plus. It's a video. It's a video. Okay. So that's the genitalia. You see, it looks pretty normal, right? And the hyperemia here, mm -hmm. yeah? which is yeah. connected yeah. to the to the clinical scenario we saw. Mm -hmm. okay. So, we were managed to catheterize the urethra just yeah. with a four French, uh, yeah. very small uh, urethral uh, tube yeah. up to the penoscrotal uh, junction. Uh, junction. Yeah, where it often gets stenotic. Yeah, yeah. that's stenotic. Right. That's correct. Yeah, it's very common uh, in this situation that you have the orthotopic urethra is very small. That's right. And, uh, <coughs> I, you know, I've only, I mean, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I presume that this is sort of an, you know, an H-type urethra or a Y-type right. urethra with the, which is actually real, for a duplex urethra, it's, it, it is a common, uh, and the question is, do you, do you, do you dilate the, the orthotopic urethra, which I'm less in favor of, mm -hmm. or do you work with a much more normal urethra that's ectopic to the anal verge. Okay. And, and, and I'm not joking because uh, uh, I mean, I've only done, I think, four or five of these, you know, but, uh, mm -hmm. but there is a, the video that you have where you use the tunica vaginalis, that's uh, which is on YouTube. Yes, uh, that's it's right. a spectacular video. But I, the late uh, <laughs> evolution not so was good, bad. Yeah, but but it doesn't matter because the concept is good. I didn't do the tunica vaginalis. I did. Uh, yeah. You know, a long tube, a long tube, a long uh, island tube. That's right. But uh, when I was in India, we had these two cases, and yeah. I pulled your video up, and you know, we used it to mm -hmm. lead the, lead the team. So All right. yeah, right. it was great. It's okay. great that you're putting those up like that. That's because, right. uh, very important to yeah. show. Yeah. You know, and and that's why the the Hendren thing is good too. For that's good. Stuff. Any that's of those good. videos you want to post on Hendren, yes, you of course. Put them up. All right. So that's nice. Uh, well. It's a hard case. Any, any, any people, Salvador, you have major reconstructive experience. So, what are your thoughts about uh, these situations? Anal micturition, uh, and you're expecting uh, really tough things, maybe retro duplicity. What do you imagine? <coughs> this is a very rare situation. I, I had in the past, maybe. 15 years ago, one case, exactly just this. The, the boy had a, a duplex urethra. He avoided well through that urethra. And uh, there was a duplication, but it was a, a tragic urethra. Uh, I don't remember exactly what we did, but I think we left the, the, the upper tracts, the, the bladder, and everything was normal. Uh, we, we haven't followed this case, uh, but I think anything you you be doing to drive this urine to the reactors spontaneously uh, will be not easy. Okay, and you're missing. Everything is up, is abnormal, and it, and it looks like you're missing the foreskin here too. This boy's been circumcised. Well, actually, Was not. not. Uh, no, no. Okay, it's just I pulled have, back. Okay. Yes, yeah, just retracted. Okay. Okay. We did uh, the catheterization. It was one centimeter from the border. Yeah. Uh, and then the casa. We did this yeah. uh, combined thing. I want to wow. show you. So. We have so to put some pressure. Okay, so this is from. This is from. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, it showed that we, with so pressure, pressure you, could, you, could you could go, could but in very comically way, it's, it's, uh, not straight. Not straight. So for dilation, I think it wouldn't be a proper case because it was uh, yeah. something making like, a curve. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And here you have a cystoscopy showing. Uh, the confluency of the urethra in the canal. And the bladder was normal, really normal. 
I think here's the catheter coming from, from the, the, from from the, the, the right 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 Yes, right yes, right. yes, that's right. Yeah, they join right, right at the bladder neck. Free that's catheter. right, that's right. Yeah. That's, it's almost always at the bladder neck the bladder when neck. these come together. So you worry a little bit about um, what, what you're going to do. I'm interested to hear what, what you did um, because I, I have followed your lead, you know, uh, when I've approached these. And uh, mm -hmm. there's only a handful of these, you know. Uh, but it'd be interesting to put these together because uh, the distance you have to bridge um, you, you think when you draw it on a piece of paper yeah. that you should be able to sw dissect the, or the dorsal urethra from the anal verge and swing it up, yeah. you know, almost to the penoscrotal junction, but it doesn't go it's nearly not, that far. No, no. There's a big gap, usually three, four Actually, centimeters. Actually, I had one case yeah. that I managed to do this, mm -hmm. but by coincidence, it had ypsilon urethra duplicity, yeah. but it had also bagalu urethra. Megalurethra. Megalurethra. Yeah, 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 we have also a video on that. Yes, right, yeah, yeah. And then we managed to join them together. Yeah. But it was the only case. Yeah. The other cases, I you tried to, to connect them, yeah. the gap with two stages, like you did, but yeah. the end result is poor. Yeah. We so, were happy two months, and then yeah. got a stricture, mm -hmm. which was not possible. Yeah. So that's what my the situation right now. So what we've done with these is. Uh, and, and this is borrowing from my, my mentor, John Duckett. Uh, if you have the, the foreskin, uh, what we've done is we've completely uh, uh, degloved, well, you degloved the, the penis, uh, exposed the uh, orthotopic urethra. And, and, and I don't know if this is right or not. To this day, I don't know if this is right or not. But what I've done is I've basically filleted open the, mm -hmm. the corpora. Yeah. Uh, and exposed this um, small urethra mm -hmm. and um, brought, and I've taken a long island flap mm -hmm. um, and I've buttonholed it, brought it, uh, which will easily stretch mm -hmm. uh, all the way to the perineum. Yeah. And uh, I've mobilized uh, the urethra at the anal verge. You can mm -hmm. dissect that right back to the bladder neck. Mm -hmm. And then I try to cut deeply in the perineum. Mm -hmm. I, I don't worry about the segment of the orthotopic urethra yeah. mm -hmm. that's you know going to the pino, uh, to the bladder neck. I don't mm -hmm. touch it at all. Yeah. And so I leave two urethras for parallel. a short distance mm -hmm. parallel. Mm -hmm. I take the anal verge and build a long tube yeah. that we can stretch to the penoscrotal junction. I take the rest of the penile shaft skin and sew it into the strip of orthotopic urethra. Yeah. And then the second stage, I, I go and enroll the orthotopic I urethra. See. I see. And um, I have short follow-up. I mean, I have one boy uh, that I did the first stage in India last year and one the previous year mm -hmm. that I did the first stage in. The, the boy uh, two years ago in India, uh, I, um, I had to redo the, uh, the first stage from the proximal urethra to the tip, mm -hmm. but he, he'll I'll do his second stage in January. Okay. The first boy, uh, uh, the second boy in India, um, I've got the tube, they tell me he's voiding perfectly from the, from the penoscrotal junction through the tube. Um, and, uh, and so I, I'm going to try to do his second stage. And then I have one boy um, from America that I did uh, two years ago, or 18 months ago in April, and uh, same same thing. Mm -hmm. I got his tube though all the way to the mid shaft, mm -hmm. and um, and and so when he gets a little bit older, we'll roll him out to the tip. But I, I want to make sure that he's having straight erections. So far, he seems yeah. to be okay. So th it's just you know one approach. Yeah. Well, but uh, some people have dilated the, you know, some people right. have dilated. I, I, the, have you had any experience? I've heard about that. But it I, worries I, me because I've never had good luck yes. dilating things like that. That's correct. When we do the pageants, <coughs> they were a big disappointment. For us. And you see, uh, the feeling that I had is the whole penile retra was absolutely not uh, reliable yeah, to be dilated. Yeah, I agree with you. Even with a six French uh, retro tube, yeah. we couldn't get yeah. inside. We couldn't get the cystoscope yeah. inside. In, in my experience in trying to dilate urethral atresia mm -hmm. without duplex urethra, 
has not been good no. long term. Uh, I've never had it had it work where the bladder emptied well. Yeah. So. Oh. So we did uh, what we did. Yes, Bira, please. Uh, I like the concept of uh, uh, twelve minutes. The the auto orthotopic uh, One option would be to uh, unify the orthotopic urethra with uh, uh, the ectopic urethra uh, through the perineum and augment yeah. the orthotopic urethra with buccal mucosa, what uh, 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 has been done, for example, to uh, uh, urethra structure. To open the urethra, put the buccal mucosa in, and close the urethra. So it's, uh, I think it's an option to... Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we get already now uh, also University of São Paulo from Ribeirão Preto. They are in the big auditorium. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. hello, people. They normally they come to a smaller auditorium. Yeah. So, thank you. And then we had Teresa Cristina from Maranhão, which is northeast of Brazil as well. Yeah. Okay? So, what we did is we put the patient in this uh, uh, position. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, knife, how yeah. do you call this? Uh, open the yeah you get nice access skydiver yes yeah, skydiver yeah. and then we we just incise anteriorly yeah the astral <laughs> approach yes when you split just the anterior wall you can have a nice access that yeah. was i'm telling you yesterday yeah, yeah. yes and uh Bira, you have experience with a failure as well now right? using this approach with roberto de castro yes yeah yes, we start doing this Very after nice. the experience with uh, a failure with roberto yeah. he taught us and since that, I, I've done, a, 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 I think, 10 cases. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy. Yeah, it's beautiful exposure. It's right? beautiful yeah. exposure. Yeah. And here you get the urethra. You see, a nice stump, two centimeters. Mm -hmm. And we are getting more conservative of our previous experience. Yeah. We decide just to get this, uh, uh, this urethral stump and place it as a urethrostomy. Yes, of course. And then wait and yeah. see how he does. And how, how he, he does. does. Yes, that's right. right. And yeah. it, we may consider a two stage yeah. in the future right. or something like what Bira said. Right. But uh, uh, we just uh, did it like this. Yeah. We did a uh, skin uh, subcircular incision yeah. to make it yeah. less uh, yeah. prone to strictures. And the end result is nice. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So this is a difficult case. Now I want to come to another topic that uh, many people can put their preferences. Uh, in your way of treating, Salvador has also a large experience, which is in Brazil, normally uh, we get late referrals for bladder extrophy. It's not like the US that they are, for instance, in Sao Paulo or in the main cities, you can uh, reach them uh, very early. But it's not uncommon to get late referral. <coughs> yes. Salvador, your bladder extrophies, uh, well, what's the panorama in the Recife when you get this case? Do you get uh, in the first 48 hours or later on? The, uh, it's very rare to have patients that they are born. I have quite a few, uh, but normally they come very in, in, the, in the very late age in my series of blood augmentation uh, that's now 25 years uh, I have a young lady which I reconstructed and augmented at the same time she had never been touched before by a doctor she had four children and she was 55 years old and came for the first time for a urologist and uh, we reconstructed and augmented and it was a small plate but it was soft and uh, we did a successful uh, reconstruction and augmentation at the same time and this was uh, at least 15 years ago, and she's she's now 70, and she's well. But I have pa I have operated uh, patients at 30 years of age, coming in the same situation. I think that the mean age we have is something about 
five, six years uh, of age. And uh, the neonatal period, uh, 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 really, we, uh, we get mostly uh, private patients. Uh, and as it is a rare disease, uh, quite rare, uh, this type okay. of patient yeah, and the what, neonatal what, period. What, what, what's the reason behind the late presentations? Well, I, I mean, is this like a stigmata? People don't want to no, show it? No, or why, no. why is that? It's, uh, I mean, it's the, we are thinking about the public system in Brazil. Yeah. We don't have, have uh, people uh, able to do bladder extrophy in every hospital. Yes. So it's the, our national free system, which has some difficulties still. Uh, it's not people from have insurances or have uh, access to the private or insurance-based uh, uh, health system. But uh, when the public, you may have some difficulties. At least, I mean, 11 months, we wouldn't concede late referral for Brazil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, more or less acceptable. But uh, the, the ideal thing would be to operate the, the first few days, mm -hmm. uh, which is... Okay. But nowadays, Macedo, do you think are improving a bit? There has the information. I think, I think so. I think so. Yeah, uh, Being so. spread more quickly, uh, people tend. I, I, I have noticed in the last maybe five years or less that the referrals are earlier than they used to be in the past. Cases I was talking about were really long time ago, 15, 20 years ago. Okay. Zemurillo, are you ready? <laughs> Not yet. <coughs> let, let me introduce you to Zemurillo Bastos Neto, which is from the Federal University of Juiz de Fora, it's Minas Gerais State. Uh, Bira has published a lot of in these things in Hypospade, Bastos oh, yeah, yeah, Neto, sure. yeah, yeah. on uh, testosterone, uh, I think, Hello, Mr. Murillo. Uh, what's your Hello, thoughts Sir. about bladder extrophy? Give us your yeah, impressions. Uh, I'm sorry, I just got it to work now, so uh, I haven't heard anything about the discussion before. But what you were discussing before? Okay. Okay. So, so, how would you? Uh, what your? How, can you give us your feelings about such a case? Uh, well, this right. is sort of interesting, because. Uh, uh, well, first of all, it looks like the the uh, umbilicus, yeah. you know, is separate from the <laughs> right. from the uh, bladder, which is very unusual yeah. for. Um, so, th this is a really, uh, it's this is either a really bad epispadius, which is a, which is what I think it really is, um, right. a bad epispadius, or the best bladder extrophy that, that you could have. I, I think it's a, it's perfect, yeah. and the truth is. I don't consider it uh, an emergency anymore to <clears throat> close the bladder extrafees in the first few days. Um, I think, you know, I'm very committed to, to doing osteotomies, you know, and, and we were having a conversation yesterday about how different, uh, you know, we approach it in North America versus South America. I mean, you know, when I presented our data to Sammy, uh, you know, he was kind of all over me about why, why are we worrying about, mm -hmm. you know, trying to get these kids to avoid properly. because very few of them do of true bladder extrophies. I mean, and I'm going to tell you that I think, you know, we went to an, we, I went to a, an international parents and patients conference in, in Oklahoma in, in July, and Sammy should have been there because uh, no one that I saw or met, and I met 100 patients probably, mm -hmm. was voiding normally, you know, and was 40 years old. I mean, they were all cathing. And so right. a lot of the reconstruction that we do fails, you know, That's eventually. Right. I will tell you that I think the one exception is the epispadius group because they're much more close to normal and the bladders are uniformly good, are almost uniformly good. And so th this is one, uh, you know, that I would do, when I wouldn't worry about the 10 month old. I, I would do, I would have Dave Horn and our, our, our team do uh, posterior, uh, anterior iliac osteotomies. Um, and we, and we would um, reconstruct this, um, this epispadius uh, or very form frust of bladder extrophy 
Uh, I'm guessing there's probably three or four, three and a half centimeters of pubic diastasis here. That's right. Maybe four um, at most. Um, this will come together beautifully for you. There's going to be some tissue anterior when you roll it together that doesn't have good muscle. I would aggressively trim that. Mm -hmm. I would probably take the bladder neck down to about 15 millimeters or 15, yeah, 15 millimeters or so. And I would, I would roll that tube um, about part way between the bladder neck and uh, the ureters. I would re-implant the ureters uh, at this stage. You always re-implant? I, I, Pippi Sally taught me this. Yeah. You know, he's been coming to um, India. We do 20 or so. And three years ago, he came for the first time, and he was re-implanting all of the ureters. I thought it was crazy. Um, but we saw these kids back a year later, and his girls were much better, you know, no UTIs, and the males, very little hydro. So we've incorporated that into our routine now, and I think it's a big advantage because many of these, if you do the operation, are a little slow to avoid at first, so they, you know, you do some intermittent catheterization on them initially, but I think there's real opportunity in the more mild forms of bladder extrophy to get this right. I think that, you know, the epispadius, and we were not treating them like extrophies in the past, and as a result, we had an opportunity to get some of these kids voiding well, and we, lo and we missed the opportunity. But now, this is like my ideal patient, because I, I can call it an atypical extrophy and put it in with my extrophies. It's like a distal hypospadius. It's gonna make your numbers look better. Look better. <laughs> so it's great. <laughs> Okay, Bira, I would like to comment on the osteotomy issue, uh, and then I would like, after Bira's yeah. opinion, sure. yeah, yeah. Uh, your thoughts about how essential uh, <coughs> and when, and in what uh, yeah. advantages yeah. you uh, you yeah. expect when you do it regularly, yeah. sure. like you do. Yeah. And uh, then I would like Dr. Casa to comment yeah. what would be the the appropriate uh, workout, radiological workout, in terms of. Uh, diastasis uh, pelvic, how do, what do you think we should be doing in these cases before surgery? Okay, Bira. Yeah, I agree it's the mild case of bladder extrophy, uh, but the treat is the same way. So uh, I will do osteotomy and put them in a spina cast for about uh, six yeah. weeks and uh, They'll close everything this in, in one, just one step. Yeah. That's uh, what I do. Yeah, so, so, so this is what we would do, I think. Okay. And uh, what you, concerning the advantages of just, I mean, there are people that well, don't see, do yeah, it so, regularly. So the problem with bladder extrophies is the busiest extrophy surgeons in their lifetime, uh, unless you're John Gerhardt, perhaps, um, you're going to do under 200. Yeah. You know, even guys that are doing a lot of them are, you know, yeah. going to do under 200. We put three centers together. We talked a little bit about that last night. In three years, we've done 48. Um, but that's split up amongst six surgeons. That's right. So uh, it's not like hypospadias where, you know, in a lifetime you maybe do 3,000, you know. Um, so you're just getting into the swing of this and your eyes don't work and your hands don't work anymore and uh, you're done. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I grew up at Hopkins um, where Bob and John really believed in the osteotomies. Um, we certainly, I thought, could show that the continence was better <clears throat> in the kids that were closed outside of 48 hours mm -hmm. with osteotomies versus without osteotomies. The osteotomy group seemed to do much better. So to me, I, it, if the osteotomies would help in a stiff pelvis, they should be even better in a moldable pelvis. And so I have just, it's, osteotomies have just always been a part of what I have done because it's so much easier to pull the pelvis together. There's, there's very little tension. Now, if you don't believe that, and, and I, I think we get away with a little bit less dissection, you know, deep to the pubic rami uh, in the floor, of the pelvis if you have a good osteotomy because you mobilize it a little less. We definitely damage the nerves uh, to the bladder neck, you know, in the reconstruction, I believe. And, and so the, the less you do of that, the better. Um, I don't understand the Kelly operation well enough to know whether 
they're doing better and damaging the nerves less. But the, the, I'm not seeing outcomes, you know, from the Kelly series that, you know, is much better than what we're doing. Mm -hmm. This, though, the epispadius patient, I think, like this one, to me, uh, affirms the, the concept of the anatomical repair. And I think the males are easier because you have, you know, the Vero as one, um, frame, one point of reference. You have the bladder neck as another. You have the trigone as a third. You see these folds of tissue flaring laterally uh, down deep in the bladder, which lead you to what, you know, the, the reconstruction should be. And if you mm -hmm. put it together without tension, mm -hmm. um, then I, I, think, I think some of these kids are going to void. I've seen it with my own eyes. Some of them void normally. And, and I think that that D's repair before Leadbetter got involved uh, and made it into a strict, more of a stricture, I think has real potential. Particularly if you're not really fussy about them being absolutely dry in childhood because some of them will gain, you know, you can't make a wet child dry with maturation, but if you have a damp patient, they often will get better as they get cognitively able to time their voice in, um, in as, as the prostate grows. All right. And Dr. Drach, for, for the routine work, workup uh, uh, before you, you, you manipulate the pelvis has been the x-rays in, in the past. And we have discussed uh, also with Doug and some centers do it to do MRI. Mm -hmm. The MRI, the advantage is too. First of all, you would have a, a really um, a exact uh, uh, depiction in multiple planes and also in 3D. And also it gives you the soft tissues and the relation to all the other structures. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the other one thing uh, that we, we tried is intraoperatively while you're manipulating to do Doppler mm -hmm. to see how you affect the vessels yeah. uh, and then uh, monitor your, your adjustments so that uh, intraoperatively you can decide whether you, you, you put it together enough or you have to loosen it up so that you don't compress the vessels. Okay. So that, that's something that may enhance uh, your operation. Uh, and it's a simple thing to yeah. do. Okay. Well, nice, uh, nice looking case. Yeah, nice looking case. Beautiful pictures. Yeah. That look how I discussed. Yeah. It was very favorable because the yeah. umbilical scar, scar, as you mentioned. And you've got some nice bladder up in here. That's right. Right? That's it's right. beautiful. It's beautiful. And here, uh, after the mobilization. You must have been a big smile when you saw yes. this one coming <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, that's Like right. a big fish yeah, that you big see fish. swimming. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> here, you see that it was not very, uh, the distance was not yeah. very big, but we are very aggressive. Yeah. Now, not as scaly, but uh, I think this is yeah. important. Uh, Critical. You, you topic, have got yeah. to take that those corpora and completely free them. That's right. And and tell me, do you like your corporal rotation? Outward That's what I want to ask you yeah. first. Okay. Okay. Very good. Good. Yeah. How, okay. how how do you get in red? This red. Well, a couple of things. You know, this has been the nicest thing about having Mike and the group, you know, yeah. together. Um, Pippi, you know, he went to Poland for uh, ten days and worked with Margaret. And she, and, and she, uh, she convinced him uh, this outward rotation is a good thing. I didn't really understand it until I saw him in, in India working. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, this is a, a, a good thing. You know, a guy takes 10 days out of his life, and, and he goes and he watches, <laughs> and then he comes and, and teaches me, and, you know, yeah. it goes on from there. But um, I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, the external rotation now because... The only thing that it does is that when the corpora externally rotates, the, it, it pushes the, the phallus more inferiorly mm -hmm. and shortens the distance between the scrotum and the base of the penis, which is always a little longer in the extrophy patient. Mm -hmm. And you're pulling the penis out of the prepubic fat, mm -hmm. so it's, it's more apparent. Mm -hmm. So you get a better result. I mean, I, I did one on Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and it was it was very nice. Now this one is a little bit interesting because did he get testosterone ahead of no. him? No. Now he's got to me it looks like his urethra is a little short, mm -hmm. and um, we're no longer completely um, doing the complete disassociation that Mike originally described. I, d I don't cut the 
separate the, the spongio, spongiosum distally. But I might take the urethra off. You may, may I might section. take the urethra but, off and put it yeah. ventrally. And I might take it to the penis penis girdle junction if I think I can get more length. Okay. But in the, that sense, the advantage is that you would end up with an hypospadia. Yes. And the, it, yeah. And I would, I, would have, I would not have any qualms about in, taking this higher yes. to give me the in, in splitting, you know, uh, the pubis is separated here, but getting to that, you know, well into the bladder uh, so that you can do a nice bladder neck reconstruction oh. at the same time. Okay. Bila, I think you sp spent some time in Poland, didn't you? No, no, you went I didn't. To... No, it was it didn't. Me. No, no, no. Ah, Claude Mir, that's right. We have a guy, unfortunately, he's not here. Yeah. He's in Porto Alegre. Mm -hmm. He stayed with uh, John Gerhardt. Yeah. And he spent, I think, when Nick, or 10 years, or 10 days, yeah. also in Poland. And he was very enthusiastic of yeah. the technique. Yeah. yeah. Because when you dissect all the way, you know, to uh, the junction between the anterior and the inferior margin of the pubis. And I don't like to go, I don't think you get much more length. I mean, Bob Jeff's always said, you know, you don't need to go any further because you're not going to get much more length there mm -hmm. and you may jeopardize the vessel. Um, but if you get all the way down there and do that dissection all the way to the bladder neck, as you pull the, the corporal bodies uh, inferiorly, they naturally rotate out like that. Okay. And um, and that's what Margaret, uh, yeah. I think, started to do, which I really think uh, gives a better result. Okay. Well, just interesting, here you can see the nerves, yeah. right? Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Well, this case was favorable, mm -hmm. so we kept yeah, nice. this bridge yeah. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We could uh, go here, like in hypospadias, yeah, right. very aggressively here. Yes. But just this area, yep. not to compromise uh, That's right. uh, supply. Here yeah. you could manage well with mm -hmm. the glands. Yeah. So we did this. Here you see the beautiful, uh, it, beautiful the intersymphysial yeah. ligaments. Yes, right. Was. Those and then the, the, everything went deeply. Mm -hmm. And we could, with this uh, lateral dissection of the corpora, bring it easily. So yeah. we decide for a regular uh, yeah. temporal Lunsley repair yeah. with bladder neck, mm -hmm. like you, you said. How much did you narrow the bladder neck? Do you remember if you go back? It, well, I think it's, it's, I, we are more intuitive, but I think it's, yeah. if yeah. From, it's a six French, yeah. uh, okay. very good for... But go, if you go back to uh, this picture, did, did you take any yes. tissue? Yes, we did, like you said, yes. We yes. make an incision and here, yeah. and then we make it more... Yeah. more de that area, yeah, yeah, right. And here, before mm -hmm. the... I think he's going to do great. The corporal approximation. And yeah, it looks nice. good, very nice. But this is a very favorable piece, yeah. okay? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. That's a lucky boy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I, said, uh, I think we have a... Yes, Bira? Uh, may yes. I have a question for Dr. Kenny? Uh, yes, of course. How you manage the, the pain control after the extrophy reconstruction? Pain. How do we manage the yeah. pain control? Control the pain. So, yeah. yeah. Um, well, we're we're usually we're doing a tunneled epidural, uh, continuous epidural, and we've yeah. gone to the spike of cast like you have. Um, you know, I, I, I was. I, you know, as a Hopkins guy, I was very resistant to going to this to the Spica cast until uh, we got involved with Wisconsin and Boston, who were routine, routinely using it. And and uh, I think the kids are happier in the Spica cast than they were when they're in traction. Um, but we use the epidural, um, and you know, we augment that with narcotic uh, and uh, and uh, toradol uh, as well. Okay. But they spend more time with us probably than they have to. I'm interested. When do you get them out of the hospital with your spica cast? It's asking you, Bira. Oh, sorry, I didn't, didn't hear you. Oh, <laughs> when, when when do you when do you send them home? Uh, I, I said with your spica after cast? six weeks. They yeah, stay we keep them all we, we, in the hospital. Yeah. We, we keep them too, but you know, in Wisconsin, they're sending them home at ten days. You know, with the spica, they're, they're not worried. So ten days. I think we'll evolve to that. Yeah, and with pretty good results. So. Yeah. Nice to know. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, this is for a regular case. Then we have half yeah. an hour for your last talk. Okay. Yeah, Let's that's do fine. this case quickly. Okay. Has more uh, X-rays for Casa. Casa yeah. Yes. Well, this is a regular case, eight years old male. We had some antenatal hydronephrosis left, but the mother simply didn't uh, follow it anywhere. And it was recently referred mm -hmm. with front plane, no UTIs. So, right kidney is, or, is normal, and le this is left kidney. Casa. So, the, the left ah. kidney shows pelvic LCL dilation, and the lower pole, the, the, it's more dilated. Yeah. And the echogenicity, maybe? Oh, there it looks uh, echogenic, the, the lower pole more. Yeah. Here the dilatation shows significant dilation. Mm -hmm. uh, the parenchyma is not so thin. I don't see any stones on this one. Let's see. Mm -hmm. And then the function you did the MSC. Oh, okay. Can so, you make some comments? And of course, the super uh, function on the left side that they normally they give us. The DMSA, and it's, it's hard for the mothers to understand why this kidney, which is compromised, is always functioning better. Just for the audience. So, uh, I, I mean, you are you have hyperfunction. Uh, Supra function. Uh, yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, kidneys with um, some degree of obstruction, and uh, what we have is a split function. Yes. So when we calculate that. The percentage at, at the beginning as a compensatory me mechanism, yeah. you may have uh, the abnormal looking side functioning higher yeah. compared to the normal looking side. And over time, you may have the decompensation and the numbers decreasing on that side. So that, that's a, a possibility. So you do have a, a, a compromise on the right side with the uh, Apparently decreased function. What what was the number here? I think it's 50, 55 for the left and 45 for the right, which I presume is the the, not the normal one. Yeah. Okay. But you you see the patchiness uh, of the uh, right one. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, there was no infection. At no infection. Just no pain. Infection. Just pain. We have DTPA scan here. So it is um, right. Does it seems to to wash out uh, both of them? Which which one is is that probably the right? Uh, the, right? the right that the right is is this and the, the left, left is, is this. It looks similar. Similar. Oh, on, on, yeah, on, on but both sides. Really pain. Yeah when drinking a lot on the left, which ah, is the dilated, right. yes. yeah. especially when drinking uh, yeah. uh, more fluids and... Uh, yeah. so, so it's like a crossing vessel. So do you, you think this is an in infant nebula pelvic stenosis? I mean, is that one of the things? Yes. Maybe? Yes. Uh, and how old was he? I would have... Ten or I, I, eleven years. I would take this case okay. right down to Casa's office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, you're, uh, I mean, he's had drinking intermittent pain, intermittent pain. 11 years yes. old, he, he had more than and dilatation in, intermittent? No, the dilatation was stable. Oh. We did that, well, uh, we okay. were, he was referred actually with a uh, CT scan, because there was the, this question of uh, crossing vessels. Yeah. So, here's what yes. we have. Okay. Ah, interesting. But okay. I can see that pelvis in the, the uh, core. Interesting. Well. Uh. Oops. Uh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So now we know. No, no. no I would no, operate no. on <laughs>
the earlier. Phase. But this this uh, is interesting, eh? yeah. You see, there is some pressure. Uh, it's not there affecting is, the weather. Not but there is right. significant uh, 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 hmm. narrowing and yeah. change on the left side. I mean, we're we're not seeing the the. Uh, vas that's a little bit delayed phase. Yeah. The vascular phase with the vessels are not. Well, uh, I, don't, I think it didn't that, get, but it that, was not apparent. No. Okay. Not apparent on. on no, on, on it was the presumably not uh, yeah. crossing that. Uh, so, okay. so is this a lower pole EPJ? Is, is that what you have? That's also some extent to the upper pole. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't appreciate that on the ultrasound, the initial yeah, ultrasound. Yeah. Yeah. But I think uh, from the clinical setting, he had really pain. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, Zamorillo, would you like to comment this case? Oh, I must say, look, uh, it's a difficult case to decide what to do. Uh, but I think since he has pain, it might be. Uh, a good thing to do with surgery, maybe. You know, he's, he's having pain. Uh, hydro is an important hydro, wave four. And, well, by the image in the CT scan, we can see that the valve is obstructed. I think I'll operate on him. Okay. Miguel, when do you uh, or ask for a CT scan or when you're moving? What exams uh, you suggest? Uh, what's the role of CT when you ask it? Uh, because normally we just do uh, me nuclear medicine uh, exams. So what are indications for other exams like? Uh... I don't use CT for this case. I prefer MRI. Then I have I, I do it, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I see that the renogram it's not obstructive uh, in the CT uh, show uh, a job obstruction but I, I use it always the uh, renogram for this case but always it's not the same time uh, for the uh, the same resolution but, uh, Always the ornogram is not typical. In this boy, uh, the, the curves are dissonant. Uh, it's not really obstructive. My, I don't use CT. I, when I have it done, I prefer MRI. Always. All right. Okay. Uh, we, I will ask you, yeah. uh, Dr. Dry, to yeah. summarize. Yeah. For uh, functioning uh, in MR, yeah. everything you gave yeah. us. Could you just put a, a summary for, okay. for people, the state of the art issues yeah. and your opinions on that? Please. Okay, so um, in our case, we would have done an MR urography, and that is just a dedicated MRI of the urinary tract. And that is has been so optimized that currently we can do the whole study before contrast and after contrast de facto in 18 minutes. You can do the whole study. The scan time is 18 minutes. So what we try to do is first to do a morphology uh, where you see the urinary, urinary tract and you can get a 3D. And then we give contrast and do a dynamic study. And that allows you to have the different arterial phase and then the excretory phase and then the arteries and the excretion together also. And it gives you one, it gives you a better morphology <coughs> of the whole dilatation and in relation to the uh, uh, other organs and also to the, the parenchyma, how, how it is. Um, and then with the functional uh, study, with the contrast, you can really see, first of all, the, um, the, the timing, how the contrast passes through the parenchyma and you can have different transit times, how it reaches the ureter. Uh, and how it's excreted. And then we can do split function based on the volume and what is known as PATLAC, which is an index of the glomerular filtration rate independent of the volume. 
So that is an added uh, uh, information you'll get. And uh, definitely compared to uh, uh, scintigraphy, you have a more comprehensive information and better morphology with the uh, MR urography. And this is something really not a complicated uh, uh, um, uh, application to start doing in MR. Uh, so this is something I really would encourage you. And uh, more and more centers have gone really away from the CT because the CT is not only radiation, but it doesn't give you the functional information as you want. And you cannot do dynamics like you would do in yeah. MRI. Yeah. So uh, in terms of uh, indications, when you think of all uh, pediatric urology abnormalities, okay. what would be the best uh, indications for us to, to learn now that we are getting Taiza, we are looking forward to start doing this cooperation. Uh, so for us, for all people, for pediatric urology, what were so we, we the best indications? Okay. We've been doing at CHOP now uh, with Doug's group for the past 10 years MR urography. And now we have leveled to the extent where the, there is a balanced uh, work with scintigraphy and MR urography running parallel. So the number one indication, number one, is ectopic ureter, number one. I mean, there is no better exam than MRU for anything in a patient with wetting, urinary dribbling, or where you think there is an ectopic ureter, especially in a girl. That's the number one. If you don't do anything with MR, for that one indication, the MR gives you the best answer. Then you have the uh, complex morphology. So if you have all the complex anatomies, the fusion anomalies, and especially complicated duplex kidneys, you have a better depiction with the MR. Remember, with the scintigraphy, especially the differentiation of the duplex, the smaller the upper pole is, the more difficult it is. So that advantage you have with the uh, MRU. And then the, the third group is the ones uh, uh, where you have really uh, the added reasons for the obstruction for the UPG. If you're thinking there could be a, 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 um, a crossing vessel, if you're thinking there could be a fibroepithelial polyp, uh, and if you're thinking there, there is a mismatch of the function and you are not sure to decide, and that's, that's helpful. And I'm sure Doug can tell you there are cases we do scintigraphy and before he or one of his partners operate, they do MR urography yes. and then make a decision uh, because it's sort of an equivocal uh, uh, finding on the scintigraphy. So these are the three main uh, indications. All right, that's great. Well, this oh, may, Doug, maybe you want to put in where you you see it as from from as a urologist. Yeah, the, you know the I'm using it more and more now. Um, the 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 um, you know the thousands of cases that we had you know historically on, on scintigraphy make it um, uh, a little harder. Um, to, to jump right on MR. I'm sure that if we were, were doing MR for 15 years, we wouldn't use scintigraphy at all at this point. I mean, I would just say that um, the imaging is, is much, much better. The MRI always makes the pathology look worse because uh, the system is much more dilated and um, the system's much more dilated and, and uh, Remember, you're looking at the system anatomically after Lasix has been given, and so it always looks more dilated. So our tendency as surgeons is to, to look at a kidney that might be functioning at 50%, and because it looks so dilated, it's hard for us to let them go and, and, and watch them like, you know, we, we were doing in the days of, you know, Philip Ransley and John Duckett, um, Steve Koff, who, you know, was watching a, a large number of these. Um, so, you know, I think there's an adjustment as to how, you know, many of these we're operating on. I will also say that I think w with the laparoscopic and robotic approach, we've probably lowered, you know, and I'm talking just about UPJs now, but um, we've, we've probably um, lowered the barrier of surgery a little bit too because th these kids are going through getting really nice results 
with in, in situ surgery with, with the robot or the, or the laparoscope. And uh, I think the morbidity of the surgery is less. So if the morbidity of the surgery goes down, the numbers of kids that you're going to follow goes down. And um, so I think there's an evolution there. And I, and I, I, I actually think that, that syntegrity, syntegraphy will continue to die out as my generation stops working. I mean, I, you know, I mean, my the junior, more junior guys. Yeah, I, I mean, more. I know it. I can just tell you from Europe the yeah. practice. People have completely converted to MR. Europe. Yeah. People don't do cystography. Yeah. Yeah. Children don't do radionuclide uh, yeah. uh, cystography yeah. or VCUG. And, and, and it, it's it's an evolution. It's yeah. definitely. Yeah. And, and the newer generations are used to it. And it was the same when we started in uh, at CHOP. Only one urologist ordered. And now everybody orders it, and mm -hmm. it, of course it takes. Uh, and the younger urologists are e easier, and there are some come from institutions where they only did MI urography, so yeah. for them it's normal that yeah. you, do, you don't do cystography. Yeah. Some like, even a, like, a, like Arun, for yes, example. I mean, exactly. I don't think he ever uses the cystography, right? Yeah, yes. I mean, a lot of his yeah, patients you know, are, because Arun he came, was from Atlanta. So. Yeah, so he came from an institution where they exclusively do. Uh, 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 MR urography. So yeah. coming here for him, it's of course self-evident to do it. And I mean, uh, um, there is definitely no medical uh, disadvantage. There is 100% medical advantages in doing MRU. The only thing is the ancillary thing is you have to sedate some of the patients and there are ways to lower the sedation mm -hmm. and there are ways we have optimized the, the sequences. and. Uh, Thaisa has done a, a marvelous job. Actually, she, she uh, reversed the sequences to avoid sedation, to do contrast first, and, and then do uh, 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 the, the, uh, the, 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 the morphology study afterwards. Yeah, that, I mean, you risk a little bit. You, the child might wake up and you have to redo, but that risk is take, uh, accounted for. And okay. that, I think, is an excellent way of approaching it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Before you have a question, I would like to ask you to give it, all the Brazilian people uh, mm -hmm. your insight about this. In, how in the practical world, how are you doing this? How you're getting the referrals? Because uh, you are you're trained and you have a lot of experience there. I yes. think that MRU will help a lot in this case. And uh, in Brazil, we have. Uh, Difficulties uh, doing sedations, and uh, the main challenge is to do these examinations without sedation. And my doubt is, he, this patient has 10 years old. He could collaborate and do the examination without sedation, yes, of years, course. Yes. But then uh, I have another challenge that is to do this examination without a vesicle catheter. Yes. Because these patients with 10 years old, mm -hmm. it's completely impossible to, to put a catheter in, in the vesicle and keep the, keep the, the child uh, comfortable and keep the child helping to do the examination. Yeah. So my, my, ask, my question to Dr. Dart is, if in this examination he will do the uh, the MRU without sedation and without a catheter, okay, that's the that's that's something important because it's something that I'm trying to do, and that's the reason why we 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 are trying to do the the dynamic the post contrast uh, phase of the MRU before morphology because then. We are in the beginning of the examination. The bladder is is uh, is not full because we are beginning. We ask to to the patient to uh, make me yes to void to, to void before getting to the uh, MRU scan, and uh, we we are trying to do this kind of uh, challenge in in helping to the ten years old boy keep comfortable doing the examination without moving and to have good results after yes. that. Uh, ju My, uh, yeah. Just to comment, the sedation, uh, I, uh, I mean, is um, if you can avoid it, 
it, it's, it's best to avoid, and definitely there are different ways uh, of uh, uh, trying to avoid the sedation. The problem is, depends on your institution. Like I can tell you, um, in Europe, uh, where I worked, we had much less sedation also for the MRU, because we took in the fact that we would try it without sedation with different means, and if it doesn't work, we'll give it a try. So in, in 80% it worked, in the 20% you had to try. But in our current institution, we have a very big sedation unit, anesthesiologist and sedation specialist. So it's a more uh, structured thing and they take care of that, not the, not the radiologist. So a lot of these are, are, are much prone to be sedated than uh, when um, I was doing the sedation and, and individually uh, arranging for each patient. Regarding the catheterization, it is really, I mean, there are uh, uh, colleagues also from Europe and we have done it. It's not necessary to put it in everyone. Where you need really a, a catheter is where you know there is high grade reflux, where you know there is mega ureter, mm -hmm. and where you're going to do deep sedation. If all these are not present, then you might forego to putting a catheter. And especially in your case, you can do that always because there is one doctor for one MR for one patient. This is a, an excellent situation you have, which we don't have. We have one doctor for multiple MRs. So that makes it more challenging for us than it is for you. Okay. So you could really individualize and say, no, I'm going to put catheter in this. I'm not going to put catheter in this. And just one thing uh, I want to share with you is that we looked at the effect of the bladder filling and the transit times, and now we just uh, presented this uh, result at the, the SPR. And it seems even with the filling, the effect is not there. So what people thought, the, 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 the reflex with the distension of the bladder and effect on the drainage is probably when you have a maximum bladder capacity being reached. But during the exam, in the most cases, we're not reaching that. So probably we're not seeing that effect. Apparently, it doesn't seem to affect because we had Foley catheter before, and we realized that in almost half of the cases, there was not sufficient drainage. And thanks to Doug, we learned that the catheter, though they give you the size, the inner diameter is much smaller with the Foley. And thanks to his advice, now we change to straight catheter. And now they drain 100% completely. So, so uh, the, this uh, uh, insertion of Foley catheter gave us the opportunity to evaluate the patients though that did not drain and to see the effect on the transit time, which apparently there is no, no significant effect. Thank you. So, Doug, yeah, you so, talk. So I don't know how much time you have. Um, we can do this talk, which is a you know a philosophy kind of thing about um, yes, you know, yes, okay, yes. Um, good, okay.